So this last weekend we had Tengu Mania 5, which was our first qualifier tournament for the World Championship. We had five slots to give out because we had 40 people participate. So that means that we had five people qualify for Worlds already, which is pretty cool. And so I wanted to give a breakdown of what the top eight looked like, kind of talk about some of their deck lists, and you know, kind of make some calls on what we could expect to see in the following tournaments. And right out the gate, we can take a look at the metagame breakdown and we see that we had in this tournament eight Tengu plant players and eight agent players. And this is something I kind of predicted. I think a lot of people are under the, the impression that Tengu plants and agents are just far and away the best deck in the format. There's nothing else like that's that good. So when there's like something on the line or like higher stakes, they gonna, they're going to opt for these decks with the expectation that it's going to like guarantee them a top or give them highest chances of tops. But if you look at the conversion rate of how many decks actually, how many like Tengu plant and agents decks actually made it in the top cut, it, you know, it, I think it tells a different story. I, I don't think you need to rely on these guys. I think there's plenty of other options out there that can like pop off and work. And so, you know, I, I'm interested to see how the meta develops, especially as things progress and especially as more people get their qualifier spots. But yeah, we'll, we'll take a look. So like I said, eight Tengu plant, eight agents, not too surprising given that this is like, you know, the first qualifier. Uh, three Cat Sith control or Unicorn control. This deck is pretty good and it's been seeing a lot of success lately. It's been popping off. So, you know, glad to see it's kind of continuing on the rise. Three Car Curry, two Gravekeeper, two Macro Stun, two Scraps, two TG Stun. And then we had a bunch of one offs. So we had a Virus Turbo, Dragoonity, Hero Beat, Jurak, Light Sworn, Six Samurai, X Saber, Crusher Control, and Junk Doppel. Hero Beat being the, there's only one Hero Beat deck was honestly shocking to me because i think that deck is insanely good and we just did not actually see <laughs> like we only saw one person playing it which is just kind of mind-boggling to me so that was kind of interesting but yeah so like i said the top five i put them in order based on who qualified so if you're cu curious about who qualified i put it in order so as we jump into the top eight you can kind of see like the first three did not qualify unfortunately did not like, they missed the mark as a reminder we give qualifier spots for every eight people that enter the tournament and quite frankly i think this tournament was a bit smaller than i would expect the other ones to be the main reason for that is there was another tournament that had some overlap of it we typically try to like schedule with other formats and and everything like that to make sure that we don't have overlap but unfortunately there just was this weekend so um i'm expecting to see like the next couple tournaments actually have a bigger turnout just because you know we're, we're like i said we're trying to avoid as many schedule conflicts as possible so you know everyone can play everything but yeah so the next one just so we're clear the next tournament the next invitational or tournament that can get you a spot in worlds is going to be my invitational tournament it's going to be a tcg rewind qualifier tournament so by all you have to do same thing just like tango mania you just join in and you can come participate it's going to be in my discord it'll be linked in the description so if you want to hop in the next one that's literally coming up next month it's coming up real soon within the next month we got november 11th is going to be my tournament and some people are confused you know they think that you have to be invited to participate no nope, open to the public anyone can join anyone can come play uh the reason why it's called an invitational is because this tournament is going to have an invite or invites to worlds in the same way that the tango mania tournaments do so make sure you guys show up if you want to try to get that qualifier spot for worlds compete for up to 500 plus dollars uh like i said that amount could be going up so um but we, we you know we can't confirm till things are official so uh yeah that there's a lot of potential there so make sure you guys come out to that but we'll just move right on we'll talk about the top eight decks so first things first we had quinning who got top eight with light sworn and this is a deck that i like i said i i think it's pretty good or maybe even underrated this list is really spicy and i think it was the only light sworn list in the tournament but like i said light sworn has a pretty decent conversion rate it's typically topping when it's getting played so like it, it's not bad i mean the last two times it's managed to win this time it you know came close losing to top in, in top eight which is you know still a pretty impressive run but this build is kind of bizarre so we should definitely talk about it so the first thing you can notice is we have a lot of bizarre light sworn names in here. Like we've got the Graganith light sworn dragon. We've got Genis light sworn mender. Um, and even things like Shire, the light sworn spirit. I'm not sure why we're on two copies of this card. I think the biggest thing is like 
they're trying to max out on names so this can kind of become a beater later in the game but eh, i don't know it just it just feels kind of bizarre to me also one wolf i mean some people don't like bricking on wolf I personally feel like if you're playing Light Sworn, just full gamble. I, I play three wolf every time I play Light Sworn. I full send, you know, like you, you, you're playing for that high variance. I, I like going on big on wolf and, you know, deal with the consequences later of that. But yeah, still really interesting. Also on Vortex Trooper, when this card is normal summon shuffle, you can shovel two cards from your hand to the deck, then draw two cards. If it's destroyed, draw one. So this is kind of nice because it probably, you know, fixes some of your brickier hands, which like the deck does have a tendency to occasionally draw kind of poor. So being able to kind of refresh a couple cards and the fact that it draws you a card so it replaces itself, it's kind of nice. It's, it's not too bad. So I kind of see the line of thinking with this. We're also opting for a single copy of Mirror Force. Just maybe that spicy blowout card your opponent's definitely not going to expect. We got Dust Shoot call the haunted and beckoning which is pretty cool uh, i like call the haunted just for celestia plays they're opting for two celestia which is pretty good but yeah overall very interesting list from quinning it, it's i don't i don't think i've seen this player in tournaments before so it's cool to see some new faces um interesting to see if they decide to like double down and bring light Sworn back in the next one uh just because like they came so close to qualifying right like and honestly it was a pretty close match i, I want to say oh no no top top eight wasn't super close but most of their matches were really back and forth and like i saw some impressive wins from quinning off of just playing light Sworn. so Yep, that's the first deck. We'll move on to the second. So the next deck we need to talk about is Jaina, who is playing Tengu Plants. And we're looking like, honestly, pretty standard Tengu Plant list. Some interesting one-offs, like the bottomless is kind of interesting. And then we have like Mirror Force. Just going for a bit heavier of a trap build, which honestly, like a lot of people typically default to like Triple Thunder King and kind of like cut down on monsters but Jaina went a different route where she kind of just maintained the like the monster lineup that we see and then moved on to adding more traps in which i'm not sure how that panned out you know it, it's kind of a interesting call in my in my opinion also i'm noticing there's not a single enemy controller in here and we're on three copies of duality <laughs> i don't know i personally think that's just a sin i would i would much rather have these dualities just be uh enemy controllers i think enemy controller is just the best card in the deck and duality feels really limiting for a deck like tengu plants because like it turns off a lot of your plays and you're trying to special summon a lot so i feel like you would brick on this but maybe i'm wrong jayna can probably answer in the comments but yeah i personally that's a that's a wild choice to run three duality and tengu plants um but yeah, then, then we moved on. Side deck, three puppet plan inside. We're really respecting heroes here, which is probably smart, even though there really just weren't many hero players. The hero matchup looking good. We got Leeching the Light as well. Um, no Decree, which is interesting as well. So like very limited back row removal. So I don't know, like we have heavy side for heroes, but not really respecting the other back row decks just by having the a three MSC heavy, I don't think is enough when decks like you know, TG stun and like grave keepers are all flocking around too. So that's kind of interesting. Also no closed forest for, um, for the grave keeper matchup, which I think the second pretty easily make ancient fairy dragon, but it looks like Jaina didn't even elect to run it. She just ran colossal fighter instead. I wonder how relevant that that was for her. So yeah, definitely some interesting choices in this Tangu plant list. I, I don't know how I feel about them, but I I'd be curious to know why Jaina did some of these things. But yeah, we'll move on to the next deck. So we have Dinosaur Ryuzaki, who was playing Car Curry, which I was pretty happy about. He's glad glad to see some Car Curry play in the top cut. You know, we got the Pretty standard looking list. Running double compulse. This kind of looks similar to the list that's just on my website. In fact, it very well could be. Now I want to check. Okay, definitely not the same list, but pretty close. It looks very similar to the one that like topped, I think it was YCS Toronto or something. It, this is this is a very familiar build to me. We're opting for three quick, which I feel like most people have kind of come to the consensus that two is enough. It's kind of like a blizzard where like, yeah, it's got 1700 attack, but it's not that insane. We're also not running Hypa, which I personally think Hypa is super worth it. I think like, I, I also have said it before, but I think Nisamu is just the best Karakuri. Like 
it's it's the best standalone car curry because it just stalls like you can kind of float around on it for a while before you commit to a play and since car curry requires two cards to make anything happen i really feel like this card is just the most important uh and especially because by slamming hypa this card also becomes an out to thunder king which is always a problem for car curry so uh, that I mean, that's my take. That that's my personal preference. So I, I just find it interesting that we're like not on hypo. We're on quick or three quick and two Nisamu. Like I feel like you could just at least take out if you don't want to be hypo. That's fine. But I think you at least swap quick for Nisamu because I feel like this is just going to be more useful and come up more than this. I'm not too sure though. You know what the kind of wonder what dinosaur ryuzaki things it's a long ass name uh but yeah so looking down the rest of the list everything looks pretty standard i think smashing ground is really good in this deck the bottomless is good interesting why they wanted compulse let alone two in the main deck that, that's pretty spicy I, i'm not sure what you're afraid of here and i think i'd rather have like deep prison or something to deal with thunder king because again thunder king is just the biggest problem for this deck so the double compulse is a bit spicy i I'm not sure why they wanted two, but you know, if you're in the, if you're out there, Dinosaur Ryuzaki, feel free to fill me in in the comments why two Compulse over some of the other trap cards out there. Uh, moving on to the side deck, there's some Spice Chain Disappearance. This card is, you know, some people have been electing to run this card. I'm interested to see what matchups you want to put this in for, because yeah, it's, it's kind of a it's a very unique card, very unique like interesting thing also dimensional fissure in the side that's pretty spicy i mean car curries don't necessarily rely on the graveyard but again if you're opting for three quick then this card becomes a lot worse so yeah that's pretty interesting we've got two dust tornado not going for decree but you're also on heavy traps so that kind of makes sense uh kaiku uh i like this card a lot i think it's pretty good but the other interesting card i want to talk about is going to be smashing horn Oh, also, we have Shadow Imprisoning Mirrors. What is that in for? There's really no, like, crazy dark decks. So I don't know what that is, what, what the purpose of Shadow Imprisoning Mirror is, but I'd really like to know why that's in there. But Smashing Horn, this card is kind of cool. It says, when a monster effect or trap card activates that negates the normal or special summon of a monster, negate the summon, or negate the activation, destroy it. So you can set this and then synchro into a Thunder King. Your opponent's going to think they're safe, and then you can Smashing Horn the Thunder King effect. That's kind of spicy. I've, I've always wondered, like, wanted to test this card because it has some applications. I just don't know how good it actually is. So, yeah, I, I would definitely be curious, Dinosaur Ryozaki, how this tested. So, if you're out there, please let me know because this, this is a spicy call. But other than that, pretty standard card, Curry. You know, I'd love to see it. This deck is super cool. Sad it didn't quite make it in there to qualify, but... You know, we're going to move on to the top five decks that did. And we didn't, like, play tiebreakers. It was basically just whoever had, like, the best tiebreakers. Like, we didn't play any, like, uh, any matches to determine who got fifth. It was just, like, based on tiebreakers. So, moving on to, I guess, fifth place, but it was just top eight. Um, Himne was the one odd man out who got the fifth qualifier spot to, to make it in. And he is on Agents, which this is looking like your pretty cookie cutter standard Agents. Really heavy on the hand traps. Triple Herald, Triple Maxi. I bet this was actually insane for this tournament just because of how many people were on Tengu Plants. Just being on three Maxi sounds like really nuts if you have eight people on Tengu Plants in the tournament. But generically speaking, I think this is like really risky. But, you know, it, it is what it is. But then we got a spicy little econ in there. <laughs> I don't know what the reasoning is. But I mean, I love econ. I think it's a really good card. But this over the third MST is kind of spicy. Uh, and Herald of Greenlight. I saw multiple people on Herald of Greenlight this tournament where you, you just hit a random spell and it, it sometimes just catches your opponent off guard. So... Yeah, I'm really curious about this. At the end of the day, it's just discard fodder for either Herald of Orange Light, but also just being able to negate a spell probably comes up big, especially when they're trying to Dark Hole a Hyperion or even Mind Control, something like that. This could be a, a game saver. So I am interested, Himne, how, how this tested for you, because like I said, I think I saw multiple people on Herald of Green Light uh, this weekend. But other than that, pretty standard agents, guys. It's pretty interesting to see just some of the little one-off tech cards but we can move on to top four and the first deck we have is we have 
Jaden Yuki, who's a former Tengu Mania champion, actually coming back with their standard Tengu Plant deck. This is like almost the same list they topped with before, but it looks like they they cut the main deck to bunk. They initially were on main deck to bunk. Looks like they went away from that. Went for Double D Prison. This list is pretty clean. I mean, it, it really just reminds you of the Billy Bragg plants, except again, we're reducing enemy controller. I, I don't know. I, I don't know why so many people want to cut this card when I, like, I swear this card just wins games. I literally saw it win a game for Jay Yuki that otherwise was just completely lost. Like, I think this card is just the best card in Tengu Plant. So I'm really curious why so many Tengu Plant players just elect to cut this to one or even not at all. This card's so important in my opinion, but yeah. Looking at it, it's basically what we've seen before, just standard Tengu plants. Even the tech, there's really no like crazy spicy text to it, but still, you know, is what it is. We can move on to third, fourth, which is going to be Janky. Janky bringing back the Cat Sith control. This is just what you've kind of already seen. Looking like they added a Lance in. I'm not sure if that was there prior, but this deck is been kind of revolutionary like janky brought it in and now a lot of people are opting to play it and it looks like it's kind of netting a lot of wins and you know qualified in the first tournament so that's really cool to see but yeah this this deck is really really strong i i honestly need to test it myself i haven't got to play it at all Ooh, i see a spicy fabled cerebral i'm not sure if that was in there prior and we even have one hamster one Raiko. i guess the hamster can also summon out the cerebral so it can get you a level two tuner which is probably pretty insane because like your other normal summons it, it gives you a lot of options right like you're, you can like normal summon tour guide and then synchro for five after you summon a sangan or you can do things like summon a chaos orc and then use kushano to discard cerebral so i actually really like the direction janky's going for this Th this card feels really spicy to me and i feel like it it can offer a lot it's also another light target which is pretty nice because the only other lights you have are like the Cat Sith and the Kushano itself. Raiko also enables it alongside Valor. But this list is looking really clean. I'm liking to see, I'm liking the direction we're going. There's another Raiko inside, maybe for extra spot removal. Probably for like counter side for when your opponent puts in Thunder Kings. Because a lot of people are siding Thunder King against Janky. But yeah, overall, really cool list. Glad to see the improvements just over time. Janky always kind of upgrading the deck. Uh... Yeah, because once we look a little bit closer, there, there's a lot of little unique stuff in here. So, yeah, congrats to Janky making it in to the qualifier for Worlds. We'll move on to second place. And this was Psycon bringing back the Dragoonities. But this time, they went a slightly different direction. Before they were maining a single copy of Dark Samorg, now they just decided to cut that down and just go for standard Dragoonity. Not sure why. I actually really like this card in the main deck. But in this tournament, I guess it was the right call because we really didn't see crazy back row decks. There really wasn't a lot of representation for like heroes, gravekeepers, and TG stun, especially compared to the Tengu plant representation. So maybe this is just a smart meta call. Opting for the double maxi in main over Valor. Again, I, I'm surprised that that's a thing, especially because there's no Valor in side deck. That's really impressive that they opted to do that. They must really not feel the impact of Valor or like getting trished. Oh, I guess there's one Valor in main. I see the one Valor. I didn't notice that until now. But still, like, I feel like Trishula is so relevant against this deck, and we, we got one Valor to defend against it. Bottomless came up a lot. I saw Bottomless have, being mained by a lot of people. This card was catching a lot of people off guard because not a, it was like really falling out of flavor. Now people are really liking it. So that's kind of interesting. But yeah, really cool to see Dragoonity. I mean, this tournament was much bigger than the last time Psycon won. Um, so this tournament is a really good representation of this deck's strength. I've really wanted to tamper with this build myself because I think it looks like a lot of fun to play. I also noticed that, <laughs> see, now this is something I, I, I do think, I, I noticed on stream there actually were a lot of scenarios where the third Vajriana could have came up, so I'm wondering if there isn't a world where Saigon decides to bring this back, because I definitely saw opportunities for the third Vajriana where it would have been good, and then we can also take a look at, like, the Red Dragon Archfiend, this card came in clutch for Saigon as well, I saw it, like, blow out, like, Someone was just setting up heavy defenses against him. It just blew it out really hard. It's really good against things like Gravekeeper, stuff like that. You can just pop set cards, which feels really good. So 
That card was kind of cool. I'm not sure how relevant some of the other cards in the extra deck are where we couldn't make room for the Vajrayana. I know the reasoning, which is like typically you don't, but I did see Windows, like I, I feel like I saw a couple times where they could have got opted for the third Vajrayana and didn't. So, because they obviously didn't have it. So I wonder if that's gonna change Sycon's mind or maybe make him want to elect to go back into more copies of Vajrayana. But otherwise, Really cool to see. Glad to see Dragoonie getting some representation. As the only Dragoonie deck, it made it all the way to second place, which is really crazy. And then we got to go talk about first place, which was Brahim Pokes Heroes. This is just the most standard and probably beautifully built hero stun list out there. You know, I don't really disagree with any of the tech choices. The only, I, I, the only thing I'm curious about is the main deck Super Poly. I don't know how ideal that was um because you know super poly can be really hit or miss so i'd be interested to know how this card felt but for the most part this is like your most like standard hero stun max out on thunder king max out on alias low monster count because you got cards like hero blast to recycle stuff and uh the single snowman eater for the beautiful future fusion play all pretty good you know I, i'm down for it looks good uh no heavy storm in main triple msc heavy in the side nobleman of cross out maybe for the gravekeeper matchup just because it's really annoying uh which can make some sense uh but yeah i mean th th this list is pretty cool because we actually got to see dragon knight draco equesti make it in to the like make it into like gameplay we saw it see play in in a tournament we you know which was really cool we saw it super poly a stardust dragon which i don't know i just thought that was kind of neat but either way Brahim Poke, I don't think Brahim Poke has caught any dubs yet. So this would be Brahim Poke's first, first tournament win for our server, at least. I'm not entirely sure. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I know you've always managed to make it pretty high, but I, I don't think you've actually caught a dub yet. So this is definitely the best tournament to catch a dub in. You got that prize money and you got to qualify for Worlds. So we have now met all of the first players to enter. And the interesting thing I think about this is we had both um, Jaden Yuki and Himne qualify for like qualify for Worlds. So like two former Tengu Mania champion, like her <laughs> champions already qualified. So that's really interesting. It, I, I really wonder how these other tournaments are gonna go. Cause as you guys know, the next tournament, if they already have an invite, they're still welcome to play and compete for the prize pool, but if they already have an invite, the invite gets passes down to the next people below them. So if these guys keep dominating, it would be really interesting to see how that how that plays out. Like how far down you can go to get an invite. That'd be kind of funny. But yeah, I'm really excited to see like that we have some of like our, our notoriously strong co competitors making it into the world championship. All these guys are like phenomenal players. So I'm really excited to see just what that means for the world championship. We still have plenty of qualifiers to go and hopefully we get more people to participate in these tournaments to grow them even bigger, get more people qualified for worlds because that world's tournament is going to be really hype. It's going to be the best of the best competing for, you know, a decent size amount of money, especially if it goes up. So um, that's really cool. But yeah, what, what I can take away from this tournament, like I said, you can we can look at the top eight decks. We had two Tengu plants, one Agents, and they saw most of the representation out of like the decks in the pool. And I think that makes a pretty good statement, in my opinion, that like I don't think people can just rely on these to get easy tops. There's a lot of good decks that are out there that people should take advantage of. And so I, I am wondering if things are gonna shift my expectation for the next tournament is that more people are going to be on heroes because I feel like most people were shocked that there was only one hero deck entered. And so I'm going to make the read that heroes is going to be a, a deck that people are going to like switch over to. I think this is like a deck for an easy top. And then if majority of the meta actually switches to these back row decks after seeing that like they didn't see a lot of representation, again, I'm going to say that there's decks like X Sabers and stuff that can go up in priority and become a lot stronger. But yeah, overall, really cool tournament, really like kind of what I expected from the first one. But I'm really ex excited to see where things go, especially because the players, like some of these like really insane players, like, you know, Hime, Jaden Yuki, like all Janky, all these guys here are like, they now qualify 
And so since they've qualified, all they are competing for is prize money. So maybe they'll switch it up and bring out more spicy stuff or just like maybe play for more matchup swingy decks and stuff just to try to like knock people out or like hurt other people's chances of like making top cut. That would be really cool. I, I'm just interested to see. They have a lot of freedom. They don't really have to stick to what they know. Since they've already qualified, they can start experimenting. And they have a lot of time now to try and like make other decks work. Which I'm hoping to see. I think that'd be really cool to see people experimenting with different stuff. Now that they've got the safety and security. Knowing that they have made it into the world's tournament. And they can give it a go. But other than that, guys. we got to give a quick shout out to Advanced. If you guys aren't aware, Advanced is the sponsor of this tournament. They have thrown in $500 to our prize pool, and they also put a bit of commission on any sales that are made. That'll go straight into the prize pool as well. So if you guys want to support the Tengu Plant format, just know that Advanced is one of the first companies to ever support like Retro Yu-Gi-Oh! in general. Like This is kind of a test time for them or like you know this year is going to be a test year for them to see if they want to continue supporting tengu plant format and the best way for them to you know for it to make sense for them is for us to generate sales for them so just by supporting getting some products i frequently use advanced i'm literally drinking it right now i got it right here you know uh just just by supporting their products you're supporting the growth of tengu plant format and it's really cool to be able to put on these events so i would highly encourage you to you know just give it a check like check out their site maybe just pick up one thing if you know if you want to just throw some support at the tengu plant format it's gonna it's gonna go a long way for sure especially just because of how supportive they have been so that's one other thing and then also we got to give a quick shout out to my patreons so shout out to Richard Beast Eyes, Slap God, my dude, Photo Shooty, Brian Ford, and Sven Olbrand. Thank you guys so much for the support. But other than that, guys, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next qualifier next month. But make sure you guys have a great time doing today.